And now Jim should be able to start sharing. So can you hear very me? good. So behind. Yes, we can hear you. So this looks good. And so thank you. Thank you for waiting until now. Hey, hey, hey. Ed, Ed, can you see the screen? All right. So you can hear me and see me? Yes. And it's very empty in Texas behind you. Yeah, that's actually West Texas. They um, you know this movie um on uh, no Country for Old Men, I think that's the name of it, was actually filmed in this area. And the hills, actually mountains over my, this shoulder, <laughs> uh, they took $25 million worth of silver out of them at one time. So it's an interesting place. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, our real space code, and I'm gonna give you a, a, a little bit of history about it, and I'm gonna focus on the um, algorithms. I hope you can see the uh, cursor. Can you see the cursor? Excellent, okay. So let's see if we can make this advance. So that's another big thing. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about building a code for nanoscale systems. My emphasis is going to be on algorithms and not on the related hardware, although the hardware is going to be important and I will make a few comments as we go along. I think it was first recognized in the early 90s, certainly by, um, it is 1990s, uh, by NSF, that there was a real need uh, to do computational work for real materials. And at, at that time, it was felt that there was a revolution going on in computers, namely parallel computing, and that it had the time was apropos for funding. Excuse me, for funding uh, new approaches that would combine uh, computation and, let's say, materials physics. And so before I begin, I wanna give some examples of the types of problems that you can do computationally and why you would want to do large scale systems. So I have three examples here. They're, they're somewhat older examples. On the far left, uh, one of the things that we were interested in a number of years ago was how does magnetism evolve? So if I take one iron atom, let's say, and I add another iron atom, and I add another ad iron atom, eventually I'll change the magnetization in that cluster, but I won't do it in a uniform fashion. And there are some experiment. There are three panels there, and the uh, ones with air bars. Uh, that's the experiment. The theory should have air bars, but it it doesn't. Um, and you see, there are some clusters of iron that are anomalously large, and there are some that are small. And so we wanted to see if we could follow this. Could we start with an individual iron atom and go out to a large enough cluster where we would reproduce the ball? And that took maybe four or 500 iron atoms. And you know it's not trivial, you have to worry about spin, although in this case, we treated them as, as collinear. And we made a lot of progress. We could understand why some uh, clusters showed anomalously low moments, namely they had surfaces without many low coordinated um, atoms on the surface. And we got a reasonable representation. We could argue that smaller iron atoms were made uh, from icosahedral environments. And as we got larger and larger, um, we started to look at close pack structures like uh, FCC. Uh, iron or BCC iron. The center panel shows the evolution of a Schottky barrier. That is how if I take a semiconductor and I put one layer of, of metal down, I put another layer of metal down, I put another layer of metal down, just what determines where the Fermi level is in that kind of junction. It involves like 1,500, 2,000 uh, atoms, and this was done about uh, six years ago. And then on the far panel, I have an example where you take large nanoclusters, and one is interested in looking at, um, hold on just a second. Um, 
where I have uh, example of what's called self purification. In other words, if I take a sufficiently large nanocrystal and I have a defect in it, is it possible that that defect is not energetic, that it will migrate to the surface because it's a nanostructure, sit on the surface and essentially purify the internal system? And, and that was something that, that we showed also. We showed that when you put a impurity in, indeed, it, it, it really raised the, the energy. It was very costly from an energetic point of view. So that's just an assortment. I have one more, and then I'll start uh, talking more about the code. Um, the last one is a, is a recent one, and that is, is the, there are a number of experimental measurements in the literature which show probes of molecules or surfaces. Some of these probes done with atomic force microscopy have actually reached some atomic resolution. Uh, there's a picture here, again, this is a little older, it's from Science in 2012, where a polycyclic hydrocarbon was imaged, and they, they made a colorized uh, image out of it. You, you can buy this image, by the way, on, uh, from somebody that tells want to sell you scientific art. Well, we didn't do that. We made our own simulation, and I decided I would colorize it, but it's it's unnerving to somebody who's done theory over the years. First of all, it's a very costly computation because in principle, you have the molecule, you have the substrate, you have a tip, and you want to raster this tip back and forth over the molecule. You may have hundreds of atoms in the system plus the substrate, and you want to look at maybe a, a, a grid over this molecule, which may have a hundred, uh, maybe a maybe a thousand points and you want to do this at various heights. But what's scary is if you look at the experiment, you see uh, little wispy structures here uh, perpendicular to this bond and you see it also in the simulation. Even the distortion in these six fold rings, you see a distortion in here. And we found these only came about with the introduction of lateral forces. Okay, so this is about three minutes worth of why you would want to do um, large scale systems. So how are we gonna do this? Our work is focused on solving the density functional uh, Cohen-Sham equation. Um, I'd like to think I, I wouldn't have to go through this in detail after several days of this, but uh, I wanted to make a couple of points here. Uh, one of the points is, is that there's not been much talk about the pseudopotential part of many of these calculations, but it's very important to construct accurate pseudopotentials. In fact, when one is dealing with forces, sometimes it's more important to make sure the pseudopotential is correct as opposed to augmenting the basis or, in our case, changing the grid. In any event, um, we're going to solve this equation as an eigenvalue problem and we're going to need to calculate the density to start the problem and then iterate it to self-consistent solution. So why don't we just do that? Well, we want to do it for systems with hundreds of atoms, typically thousands of atoms. Um, I'm going to show you a system today with 26,000 atoms. There's no reason why you couldn't go much higher than that. There's nothing special about this. The only two ingredients that go in in terms of physical uh, concepts or physical principles are uh, pseudopotentials and density functional theory. That's it. Uh, we're not assuming any special form on the wave function or um, any other uh, approximations to uh, make the problem uh, more readily solve it. soluble. I think that's right. Uh, solvable. Okay, so I'm going to focus on algorithms, and because algorithms are really the most important thing that make this work. If you ask me, would I rather have the hardware of, uh, of today, but using algorithms, say, of 20 years ago, or vice versa, I'd rather have the algorithms today and older hardware, because I can usually let it run longer, but algorithms are, are what makes the um, the system work and, 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 and have us get a solution. Okay, so um, our goal is we want these algorithms to be easy to implement. We'd like them to be transparent. We're gonna focus on the bottlenecks of solving 
the Cohen sham equation, and I'll tell you what those bottlenecks are forthwith. Um, we want to, of course, capitalize on contemporary computational platforms. It'd be crazy not to, I mean, given the options. And uh, in many cases, we want to add uh, extra layers of parallelism. And also with today's uh, architectures, we want to minimize communications. Okay, and our goal in all of this is scaling is important, sure, but in the end, it's time the solution that counts. I think somebody earlier in the meeting mentioned this is a, a scales as, as a cube, and it does. I mean, the, the worst part of this calculation does have a cubic term in it, but in practice, uh, most of the DFT uh, codes go as the square of the number of states maybe 2.2, 2.3, something like that. And that's because the prefactor on some of these terms that don't scale as well are pretty small. Okay, and my final thought, there it is, is that hardware is going to be transitory, but algorithms are forever. Paul Kent in his talk on Monday mentioned this in some sense, that the algorithms really we need to be a robust, the uh, hardware is gonna change but how we view a solution to this problem, if we have solid algorithms, um, probably will not, not change as much. Okay, uh, I've been through there. Let's see if we can move on. Okay, it's, oh shoot. It's always nice to get somebody to say something good about what you're doing where it doesn't come from you. So there was a compendium, um, a few years ago on real space codes and the authors of the compendium, uh, Friediana and Solheim said that real space numerical electronic structure mazes have lately, well, okay, maybe back to 1990, attracted interest because they're mathematically robust, accurate and well suited uh, for parallel computing. Okay, well, let's see why. I'm gonna show you a system in which this is an example of a localized system. And we're going to put it in a large domain. Although we could in principle have um, a wire or a film, uh, in this case, a cluster or periodic boundary conditions, we've done all three. And the idea is outside of, in this case, for a confined system, outside of this confined system, we'll say the wave function vanishes. And we're interested in solving uh, the problem on a grid. And the grid I'm going to be using is going to be cubic. And so we're going to discretize the Cohen sham equation on this grid, and then we're going to solve it using um, a higher order difference. Okay, well, here's uh, another plot that, or not a plot, it's not a plot, it's a diagram that uh, is uh, commonly shown. And the bottleneck that I'd like to start off with is when we do a self-consistent solution, you know, we guess at the potential, we solve an eigenvalue problem. We take that eigenvalue problem, get a new charge density, a new Coulomb potential, whatever functional we're using, construct a new potential, add the output and the input, usually not on a one-to-one -one basis. But the problem here is solving that eigenvalue problem. That's 90%, 99% of the problem. So I want to talk about eigensolvers. Okay, and we're going to use subspace filtering to reduce the diagonalization time. This is an older idea, and I'll go through it fairly quickly because I suspect some of you are familiar with it. And then I'll talk about what other uh, advances we'd like to make in terms of algorithms. Okay, well, suppose I, I have a, a what I'll call a wave function matrix, and I let's suppose I, I had a, a representation where I had the various eigenvectors uh, in this matrix. If I take that matrix times its transpose, and I look at the diagonal elements, I say, okay, that's the charge density. That's what I really want. I want the charge density uh, to construct the self-consistent potential. I'm not interested um, immediately what the eigenvalue spectrum is. I, I, I need to know the potential before I can get that spectrum. Well, I don't really need this uh, wave function matrix per se. Any rotation of it will do. So if I take an orthonormal matrix and I operate on that wave function, and then I take the transpose times it, 
I'll still have the same charge density. So what we want to do is we want to filter, that is we want to remove parts of the wave function that don't belong there. So if this is my wave function vector over here, I'm going to take a polynomial and I'm going to take the um, real space matrix that I'm going to set up and I'm going to express that as a polynomial. Okay, I could take say a h squared plus b h, okay? And I'm going to multiply that polynomial times some trial wave function. Well, when I do it, I'm going to get out a polynomial evaluated at some specific uh, eigenvalue according to what space I have, according to whatever wave function belongs in this Q matrix. So the trick in filtering is to choose the polynomial so that it's large for the eigenvalues that I'm interested in and vanishes otherwise. Now you may very well say, well, wait a minute. If I don't, if I know the spectrum, I know where I want the eigenvalues, that's fine. But if I don't know the spectrum, then how am I supposed to set up the polynomial? That's a good question. Most of the time we know if I'm doing something, say a liquid silicon environment, I know really what the eigenvalue span is for those uh, liquid states. Or I could take a, an approximate method uh, I could do maybe one or two Lancho steps and I could get a pretty good idea of what that spectrum should be. So anyway, if I take this spectrum, I operate on it with this uh, polynomial, I'm going to get out essentially a rotation of the space. If let's say I was interested in the occupied states, I would have this be one uh, for all the occupied states and zero otherwise. I don't have to do that, but, but that's an example of what I could do. So what do I want for my polynomial? Well, what I want for my polynomial is something, uh, let's see if I can do this right, that looks like this. Schematically, I want it large where I want these states, and I want it small where I don't want it states. And like I said, uh, any polynomial will do. We do Chebyshev polynomials. They were mentioned earlier. I forget which speaker mentioned it. Uh, in a different context. Yes, I actually do remember, but let's move on. Um, and we take these uh, Chebyshev polynomials and we do an affine mapping so that they're large where we want the wave function and to have a value. And we otherwise they're small and there's a lot of advantage. There's nice recursion relations. So anyway, we take some appropriate polynomial. And what do we do next? Well, we take that polynomial, whatever it is, and it involves matrix vector multiplications. So we're going to do a lot of matrix vec operations, mat vec operations, where our, this is our Hamiltonian in real space. Now, this could be really big. I mean, if I had a cube, say 100 grid points by 100 grid points by 100 grid points, my Hamiltonian could be a million by million. However, we never explicitly store it, and it's extraordinarily sparse, so that's fine. This, however, is still is going to remain a bottle effect. Uh, doing a lot of mat vec operations, even with sparse matrices, even if you do a good job on energy, memory management, is still an issue that can be improved. Okay, so but that's our operation. So we're going to take this polynomial, operate on good wave functions and filter them to make them better wave functions. Okay, now here's an example of a speed up. This is old. Uh, by the way, I like what uh, Jack the Slip said on Monday morning. He was talking about how do you know whether your code is really well written? And he's right. You know, when we start writing this code, we did a lot of dumb things back in the early 1990s. Uh, it was taking us longer to find the Hartree potential or the Coulomb potential than it was to find the eigenvalue problem. But, but we solved that. Um, but one of the things you can do is you can compare to other eigen solvers and see how you're doing. So this is a, a, a table here which shows a, a modest 500 atom silicon nanocrystal that's capped off with hydrogens. Um, it's about a 200 and that's about 300,000 grid points. And it took about, um, you know, I don't know where it says this. I don't remember the, um, 
the machine it was run on, but it took roughly about two hours, roughly speaking, uh, to solve the, the problem. If you look at AR PAC, it took an order of magnitude longer. And I'm sure this was done with a, with a pretty old machine because I'm pretty sure I could run this on a pretty close to a laptop now. Now, AR PAC is one of the best public domain eigen solvers, at least it was when we did this one. Uh, it's often used for benchmarking. How do we know that? Well, we didn't say that, the authors said that. Um, and then uh, there was an improvement by Keshe Wu or Simon, uh, TR LAN, which does a better job on looking at uh, the previous solutions. And now we only get about a factor of four or five, but the point is it speeds it up significantly. Now I'm sure some of you know this whole thing about what scientists say and what scientists mean. So if a scientist said this is a typical result, it usually means it's the best result. So I could say this is a typical result and leave it at that, but it, it truly is a typical result. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so that's where things stood maybe about five, 10 years ago, and we wanted to make some uh, improvements on the code. So what did we do? I'm gonna show you four, but I'm only gonna talk about three. The first thing we did is we did spectrum slicing, and that is we only look for the eigenvalues within a particular window that we're interested in. And this is great because if we have a lot of eigenvalues, we can farm them out to different physical processors and they can each do their own thing independently. The second thing has to do with memory management and it has to do with space filling curves. We want to improve the communication. Communication is a real issue. We knew this from the get go. Uh, I'll get ahead of myself a little bit, but when I started this work, I started working with Professor Yosef Saad. Some of you may know him and we were funded by NSF under this computational approaches for real materials. And the first thing Yosef said to me was we're not gonna do plane waves. We wanna do this in real space because we don't wanna have communication issues and we don't wanna deal with FFTs. And this discussion was only about 30 years ago. Okay, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about orthogonalization and I'm not gonna talk about 2D uh, grid processing, but that's another thing we could talk about. Okay, here's the next bottleneck. Well, once we do this filtering, we still have to do a RIT step. Let's suppose we had a thousand eigenvalues that we wanted to solve. We would have to solve for a thousand by thousand dense matrix to get the eigenvalues. That's not a big deal, but if I wanted to solve by a 50,000 by 50,000 dense matrix, that is a big deal. So you can see this here. This is uh, the time. Uh, where we have the filtering operation, and then we have the orthogonalization and the Raleigh Ritz. And you can see what happens is that this orthogonalization really does scale badly, and it's a problem. So, what we did is um, we decided to, to do a spectrum. Five minute warning. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just, to, just want to give you a five, five minute warning. Okay. All right. Sorry. We'll Thank you. No, no, we'll do it, we'll do it. <laughs> It'll be tight, but we'll do it. <laughs> so bear with me. Okay, so the idea of the spectrum slicing is say this is the spectrum density of states for something like, uh, like silicon, which it is. And we could say, well, let's only find the eigenvalues in this filter, this filter, and this filter. Now there are issues there. We can still take these chubby chub polynomials and we have to take the right combinations, but we can do that. Now the advantage of doing that, instead of having let's say a 50,000 by 50,000 dense matrix, maybe I split it up into 10, 5,000 by 5,000, which would speed things up a lot. Okay, so that's the idea. Here's the result. Uh, okay, uh, this is just the straight filtering here. One, one interval and going from 256 to 4,000 uh, processors. And you see it starts to really have an issue as you go to larger processors uh, with communication, although the matrix size hasn't changed. This is spectrum slicing. It goes down, and it's higher immediately, but then it goes down. Now, it is an issue because the sharper the window, the higher the polynomial you need, which means the more operations you need. But it clearly can, can lend to a significant decrease 
in the uh, time and adds another level of parallelism. Okay, I will just mention very briefly space filling curves. I'm not an expert on that anyway, so that gives me an excuse for going through it a little faster. But the idea is, is that it's important to linearize multiple multidimensional data. And uh, we took this as a quote uh, from Balgertz, who says that examples include uh, the discretization of partial differential equations, what we have. And the idea is, is that if you have various domains, you start linking them with these one dimensional curves and you can double the domain size. So instead of having a sample like this, you can balance it, which is much better on MPI tasks. And it reduces the communication. Remember, I said those MAT-VEC operations were still an issue. Okay, so I'll go through this fairly uh, quickly. Here's a modest size silicon uh, nanocrystal 2000 um, silicon. Uh, this is the time uh, for filtering, and this is the time if you use space filling curves. So just how you stored the data gave us a factor of almost a factor of five. No, that's not typical uh, in this case for this uh, god awful molecule, whatever it is. It, it took a, only a factor of two. Okay. Um, I want to get to, I'm almost done, believe it or not. Um, I'll skip this section to say that, that the normal Gram Schmidt um, orthogonalization can be a real problem. Here's a, for almost a 900 atom silicon. It's dominating, but if you use Cholesky QR algorithms, you can take it from 220 seconds to about 10 seconds. So like I said, if you can reduce the, the uh, prefactor, it's helpful. Okay, this is the largest system we've looked at. This is to show off. Um, it's 26,000 atoms, 23,000 silicon atoms in a large nanocrystal. It's about 10 nanometers in diameter. How do you know it's right? Well, this is the bulk density of states over here in the lower left. And this is the density of states for this god awful uh, 26,000 atom nanocrystal. And who needs K points? <laughs> you can do this. <laughs> you know, all the Van Hove singularities are there. It's great. Except that who would do this? You know, you could you could solve the density of states of crystal and silicon on a laptop, but you don't need to. You just take 26,279 atoms. I was asking my TA, is there any reason why we couldn't do 50? And the answer is not really. Um, I have a table here. Um, if you're interested in this, this is published in uh, JCTC in 2021. Uh, there were 15,000 grid points in that largest one, uh, 61,000 states, I have to show off. And we did on 16,000 processors. Not all that many, actually. Um, okay, this is, I won't go through all this. I haven't talked a lot about it. a lot of features in the code. I will say that it also does, oops, I shouldn't have done that. It also does uh, nano and GW calculations, at least for confined systems. And these are the people that I can't go without mentioning. Uh, Kai Sin Liu is the one who did a lot of the space filling curves along with Lear Kronik and Ariel Biller. And Chao Yang helped us particularly on the spectrum slicing. The people who really started this were Professor Yosa Sad at the University of Minnesota. Now Professor Young Kai Zhao at SMU and uh, Grady Schofield, who's a former student of mine these people paid all the bills, mostly Department of Energy, NERVS, TAC. Um, the most important thing I want you to remember is realspace with a dash dot org, because that's our website. And also, I want you to go to Amazon and buy that book. Okay, I'm done. Great. Uh, so we may have time for one short question. But then, yeah, thank you very much, Jim. Any questions? Meanwhile, really? James, look at look at the yeah. chat if you have it open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yet in the chat on my end, anyone? No, it's a direct message I sent because <laughs> I recently wrote yeah. for a report. Yeah. Yeah. Hardware and transient algorithms are forever for a point of contact yeah. with Livermore. 
And it's this, funny that, this, yeah. is it a coincidence or is my phrase? <laughs> I, I don't know, but this is old. I, 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 I you know some of you may know Enrico Clemente, very famous chemist, and I had to follow him and give a summary at the end of the, of the thing. And I said, well, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to say? And I think that's what I said that, uh, which is a number of years ago. So okay. it's been around. Okay, <laughs> Thank exactly. you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, I will, uh, I just have a comment. So when you, because you made the point about the dross, so when you have the phases ready, then let us know, right? I'm sorry, but I have what? When you have the phases ready for your dross, you'll let us know, right? The K phases? You'll have oh to... yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, that's an interesting question. I, I, yeah. I thought about that. If I have that information, why can't I do the inverse problem? Why can't I plot out the energy bands? And I haven't given it a whole lot of thought, but it seems to me the information is there. Uh, but it's a phase, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure how to do that. But yeah, that was the first thing I thought is that you know I should be able to track out the band structure, shouldn't I? Yeah, except you have unfortunately you have um, uh, standing waves. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I, there's no phase explicitly there. I think you have to make some assumptions. All right. Anyway, but I yeah. thought of that. <laughs> okay. Very good. So we look forward thank to the you. next time. But thank you again for the talk. And so we are at the last talk uh, of the